It's the savvy side of 9 to 5. Listen. Bueller. 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 Laugh. (laughs) And learn. Negotiation. This is what you do in business. This is The Focus Group with Tim Bennett. S-T-A-U-N-C-H. And John Nash. Keep your clothes looking neat and clean. We're all business. Except when we're not. Welcome to the Focus Group and happy Valentine's Day. I call it a Hallmark holiday. You know what? I, I don't want to splash water on it. Everybody's going to get candy and flowers, but it is a Hallmark holiday. I, I just thought we didn't wear red. We should have worn red today. I, I, we can't. This is the color you approve for me. Yeah, but uh, maybe I just, blue is the color thinking, you approve for I'm me. I'm thinking though, Valentine's Day. Red or hearts, all red. the news catches. Yeah. Hey, welcome to the show. Focusgroupradio.com is where you need to go to go find out all about us. Um, the show, the platform is run. Sitting next to me is a Valentine's Day gift for the whole internet because the internet's very thirsty on well, Valentine's you, Day. It is Tim Bennett, my good friend and co-host. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. But right next to me is Adrian De Berardinis. You said Did it I said right? it correct. Yes, yeah, I have it. F- I had it phonetically down here. You got to get this thing right. He is the bare naked chef, and he's joined us today for a special Valentine's Day broadcast to prepare for us holiday cocktail and a meal for your loved one. Your lover. A loved one. Now. Happy Valentine's Day. And Happy Adrian's Day. very specifically maybe making a pasta dish, which means you better have a loved one because pasta. Pasta. <laughs> pasta is love. Come on. Pasta is love. So we're going to turn the show around a little bit, and we're going to actually talk to Adrian before we do our normal uh, caught our eye, our banter, and business birthday. And then we're going to go to our kitchen here in the studio, which... Which I can't believe we've got a kitchen. We've got a kitchen. It smells Beautiful. fantastic. Too bad we don't have... What was the, the movie? It was Polyester. Oh, smell of And we could scratch. If you were at home, you could scratch off the smell of basil or the yeah. smell of onion or the smell of tomato or something. So, Adrian, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me, guys. You are the bare naked chef. That is I, yes. And you have a lot going on. You have a web series. I do. I, uh, I launched a naked cooking web series about a year and a half ago. Um, it uh, started out just to be sort of a little fun side project while I was starting a catering business that I was uh, starting with a girlfriend of mine out there in, in Los Angeles. And uh, I finished producing it. I put it on the internet and it went viral within a few days and uh, it sort of turned into a thing. So, so you're one of those people we hate. You throw a video <laughs> up and all of a sudden you have well, a million hits. I was one of those people that I hate. <laughs> so it's, it's, There's why it goes viral. Yeah, so it's so interestingly <laughs> enough though, we, we've, we did a show couple shows back about having a shtick and we we use Dolly Parton as a reference or Liberace or something in terms mm-hmm. of their their presence right so presley in his costume so, right so or... is that how you you came out with this idea because there's lots of obviously there's lots of people who do cooking shows so how did you decide that you know what I'm going to use what I have to uh, get what I need well that's you know that, that the whole impetus was yes there's a lot of people in the cooking space and I think that I wanted to obviously use a gimmick to set myself apart from everybody else and there isn't a, a, a large percentage of gay cooks or gay chefs in the cooking space um, so I, I, I obviously wanted to identify with my audience with the LGTB audience um, but you know first and foremost I wanted to convey my love for cooking and sort of share my cooking experience with uh, you know people around the world and uh, and if I d- did it naked that was sort of a vehicle to get them to watch then I don't know there were a lot of gay chefs I think the cooking space is pretty crowded is there actually. one that I'm, is there one that's obvious I don't know no <clears throat> I mean oh, it's, um, it's quiet it's quiet yeah oh Martha and Rachel <laughs> <laughs> well <laughs> Know about them? Don't know about them. Ramsey and that out. Whole let's let's say out. Yeah, out of the closet, chef. So you you come from a family of of food, though. Mm-hmm. Your your grandmother was an amazing cook. Your mother was an amazing cook. Amazing, amazing cook. Um, yes. You are Italian. I am. I don't. I'm not saying that that's a requirement, but yeah, a lot of Italians know really amazing <laughs> well, Canadian food, Italian right? Helps. Canadian, Canadian, Italian. Canadian, Italian. <laughs> Canadian Italian. Are you French or English? No, I'm. Uh, my mother was Canadian, uh, Irish, Scottish, and my father's. First, you know, born in Italy and immigrated to Canada when he was young. Um, but yeah, when you talk about you know food being an important part of you know Italian culture, it, it is, and it's uh, it's very much ingrained at you in you in a very at a very young age. Uh, you learn, you know, your palate gets developed very very early on, and uh, so fortunately, my family was in the restaurant business, and 
at the age of 11, um, I was working in our pizzerias. Um, as I know I can remember standing on a milk crate, working the cash register, you know, charging people for their slices of pizza, and then sort of worked my way up into the kitchen over the years. So that's how I developed my uh, my love for, for food and for cooking and Italian cooking. But um, <clears throat> this was not, so this was not your first stop on a career though. Um, no. So food might have played a huge role in your upbringing and your certainly your family and and it's an important part of everybody's family especially at mealtime um but it was not necessarily a linear like flow through that you would go from the pizza parlor and ringing up sales mm. to being a chef you, no. you had a couple of stops on the way i have yes um you know i've always been a creative person and so anything that i could kind of get my hands in that was uh, artistic or creative i was thrilled to do so um Aside from being in the restaurant business, my family also was in the, the beauty business. They had hair salons. And um, so I, um, in my mid-20s, I got my cosmetology license and I went and uh, worked in the hair industry for a, a number of years. And, you know, in the background, I was, um, but before that, I'd worked in some restaurants here in New York City, and, and then I decided I'd didn't want that life for myself. I wanted to work, you know, normal hours, and so it's a I, very different. I agree with you. Weekends yeah. and holidays. Yeah, right? yeah. you are Three totally weeks. on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a it's a tough life, the restaurant business. But um, I, uh, you know, I, I always continue to entertain. I always continue to, you know, just sort of put together these events and and dinner parties for my friends and family that uh, helped sort of, you know, kind of nurture and cultivate my love for food. And, and so when I decided to bow out of the beauty industry, I decided to sort of go, you know, follow my passion with food. And I decided to just kind of go full throttle. And this was my sort of like, I'm here. So is your, is your specialty Italian food or do you do lots of different things? I mean, you have a catering business too, yes. right? Okay. Yeah. I, you know, and I get obviously requests to make all kinds of food, French, Indian, vegan, um, so, you know, my, uh, my specialty is Italian. Um, that's my heart and soul. That's sort of, you know, the food that I uh, know with my eyes closed. Um, and, you know, the other ethnic cuisines that I love, you know, I'm always experimenting and uh, sort of exploring those. My favorite things to do is actually, uh, you know, somebody's like, oh, I want you know, I love chicken pot pie. I want to have a, a chicken pot pie. I want to make you the that's most comfort food. Chicken pot pie is very comfort. Yeah, you've ever had. <clears throat> so you know, a lot of people. I, I often equate it to everyone's got one good story. I think everyone can make one good dish. I think people can make something. <laughs> I'm and not so, sure. I, do. I, I don't know if no, I have yeah, one no, good I'm sure dish. you have a go-to thing. But does yogurt count as a dish? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I. I like there's one thing I make all the time, and my friends might ask me to make it. This this See, peanut butter chicken I used to make. I don't make it. Oh, I, I was going to say pork roast. And this other you. thing I would do, this Vietnamese dish that I learned years ago. But my my struggle in the kitchen, and this is kind of a where I wonder how you break out of it, is that you get in a rut. Yep. And you go to the go-to things all the time, and then you lose your imagination. Yeah. So for you, when you're constantly trying to reinvent, and and because you can only make the same thing over and over, right? How do you how do you break out of that to just say, let me? Is it just experimentation? Absolutely. And you sort of you know you you know which flavors play well with others. So, you know uh, you know you you. you See, I'm not sure I know that. <laughs> well, I, I, as Adrian said that I was I, and... last night we experimented. We had a. Uh, we had some shrimp with some edamame pasta and some pesto sauce. And then as a side dish, I went had gone to Zabar's. I, I had to get a vegetable, but I got these sweet potatoes Oof. with that were cooked in some kind of maple thing. No. It ended up being a salty sweet yeah. and it tasted fan I I was but like I, put, I was very it sounds though. I'm not sure that sounds And something. the the smell was there was a little conflict there when it came <laughs> off the stove and Bob had done the dinner and but I had bought the ingredients and I'm like uh-oh but the minute you started doing the the pesto would mm -hmm. be the salty right Yeah and the this parmesan cheese sweet with the maple and the salt, sweet potato and the sweet potato and it actually had sweet. a really great fun and I thought wow this is this portions were not big it was a simple dinner easy to put together and it was different yeah. it wasn't your normal throw something Would you make meat. it again? Yeah, I would happily make it again. Yeah. So it's a happy accident. Yeah. So do you have a guilty pleasure food? Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, I love fried food. 
Any oh, fried, who, but who doesn't? <laughs> you know, even fried um, Twinkies. Yeah, <laughs> fried Oreos, fried Twinkies. Absolutely. Um, I love lobster. I love. I just. Wow. I mean, I, I don't eat it all the time, but I think it's just such a perfect food. It's just. It's uh, you know, it's sweet. It's picks up a lot of the flavors of other things you mm, cook sometimes, yeah. right? Now, you know, <clears throat> speaking of uh, sweet things, you could spend an entire career being a pastry chef. You, you could, mm -hmm. in fact, do an entire career of learning how to make some of the finest desserts. And But the interesting thing I learned from a pastry chef one day was that that is a very unusual field of cooking because it's not about the process itself. It's about being able to recreate it on a consistent basis, on a daily basis, yeah. which I think is kind of fascinating. It is. You know, pastry is a whole different ball game than cooking because it's very much about exact measurements, timing. Um, you know, if you fudge those things, if you fudge the temperature. But you could fudge in the kitchen. You that's that's if you're cooking an Italian meal, no one's gonna know. It's all by feeling, yeah. you know, like and it's not you know, you're you're not doing exact measurements when you're cooking um, savory food. You're you're just sort of by by memory or by taste, you know, you're tasting as you go. You can't do that with, with baking. So you're you're truly a dash of this Absolutely. Sprig of that. <laughs> that is. So Maybe a little the, more spice today. Yeah. So for the show today, we had we had promised that if since it's Valentine's Day, and uh, if you were having somebody over tonight that you were trying to impress for dinner, you put together a little a little plan for us, and it starts with a cocktail, and then you're making us a a pasta dish. I'm gonna make right? a pasta dish tonight for you guys. Yeah. Is this something that you make a lot? It is. One of your signature dishes, then. It is, and it's also something I make for other people, sort of. You know, you know, on the fly because it's it's such a quick and easy dish, but it tastes really sort of uh, sophisticated. It, it it tastes like you've been cooking it for a really long time, and actually you can do it in 20 minutes. So so for all of you Magic. out there that want to wow your Valentine you <laughs> with this dish and look like you've slaved over the stove all afternoon, this is uh, this is a good option. Now, you gave us the recipe. Is it okay if we post it on social oh, media? Of course, and it's actually on my website, yeah. Which is? Uh, which is barenakedchef.com. Okay. Um, and uh, you can find my videos and recipes on my website and uh, some merchandise and little bio and info about... Great merch, by the way. He, he does a good white T-shirt with a nice little Bare Naked Chef logo. I approve that T-shirt. I bet Thank that T-shirt would look fit me well. I'll send you guys one. So, well, and on Instagram, you're at the Bare Naked Chef. That's right. And Twitter, you're at Chef Bare Naked. Yes, because <laughs> apparently Somebody the Bare Naked Chef taken. was taken. <laughs> yes. All right, so let's start with a cocktail. Okay, um, so I wanted to do um, like a Prosecco uh, bubbly cocktail for you guys today because, you know, it's very sort of romantic uh, cocktail. Are you good at opening the bottle? Um, you know what? You, you want me to open it? <laughs> I'll give you, Everybody you do has the honor. this thing about I the cork. Opening. I agree with you. But I was shown by a friend who's French. Not that that qualifies him to do this, All but right, he loves he loves champagne. I'll let you open it. And he has a whole technique for doing this that's, you know. You'll figure it out. It's safer. So if uh, as, as you're doing this, so is this the sort of thing, would you have the cocktail before and then wine at dinner? Yes. Or? Yeah, this is um, this is a sort of a little aperitivo. So uh, they're coming in, hey, how are you? Exactly. What's going on? Right. It smells like you've been cooking for days. I have. <laughs> wink, wink. <laughs> so when you said pomegranate, okay, go ahead. Yeah, no, I just wanted to, you know, so it's a champagne cocktail. So, of course, it's uh, something that you'd have before a meal. Um, I spike it with a little bit of vodka just to kind of make it more of a cocktail. Um, and then, you know, I chose pomegranate because it's the color, obviously, is reminiscent of right. the heart and Valentine's Day. And these little pomegranate seeds also look like little hearts floating in your glass. So, but all together, it tastes, um, you know, there's a little bit of, of tang from the pomegranate and uh, the bubbly sweet, the sweetness from the now, pomegranate. pomegranates, to me, I'm not fam I mean, I know what they are, but I don't. So you don't, you only eat the seeds, right? Right. And, yes. and I, I was always surprised. People by always that. wonder, you know, when you cut, you, people haven't seen a cut open. Uh, Mr. Bare Naked before. Chef, you're. Thank you so much. <laughs> you're, you're, you know, it's uh, the seeds that you eat, because right. they're covered in flesh, and then the skin, which is white, you do not. It's actually quite bitter, so you don't want even want to. Well, I was going to say, aren't the sick. seeds bitter too, or no? Um, not really. Not really, no. I must add bad seeds. <laughs> So what we're gonna do is that was a great movie by the way. The bad seed. The bad seed. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think I've seen that. A little bit of splash of the vodka, a, not too much. I mean, kid. if you want to get your guests or your Valentine, a little. Well, that's the whole point. Then you turn the temperature up in the house to 95, <laughs> and they've got to take the shirt off. And then 
<laughs> you got a whole methodology can for the boys in the booth. Can you turn the heat up in here? <laughs> Old. <laughs> so we're having a little prosecco with yep. the, the vodka and is. the um, pomegranate seeds. Now I asked the guy Trader Joe's if the if the pomegranate was ripe. He said he had no idea. Bring it back if it wasn't any good. Was it ripe? It was ripe. Right. I, yeah. I wonder what they would have told you at Whole Foods. They probably made something up. If, if, if they didn't know, they would have, yeah, exactly, yeah. would have said something. made something up. Hey, are there, um, you know, a lot of people go out and buy lots of spices and stuff. Are, is, are, are there, are you big on having lots of different spices it's or are very, there only... a small amount. You're, oh, I'm sorry, Tim. Only yeah. a few spices you should have in your... Um, no, I think that it's good to have a variety of spices because there's stuff that you can't buy fresh. So you, you know, things like curries, uh, you know, uh, Indian spices, East Indian spices. So you're okay with the uh, bottled spices or some dried spices um, versus I think fresh? For th I prefer certain things. I prefer fresh, like uh, basil, rosemary, thyme, mint. And ideally, like on a basil or some of the other ones you mentioned, if you had a little herb garden, you would go out literally, pick some leaves off, and you're set. Because I love the smell of like literally fresh picked basil. It's the best smell in the world. It's this. Uh, look at this. I, does the camera get this? Is this is red? Red. This is a great. It's pretty. Nice job. This is cool. Cheers. 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 Happy Valentine's, Valentine's Day, Day you guys. And we raise a glass oh, to the bare yeah. naked chef, Adrian. Thank you so much for having <laughs> Can I get a hit, Nash? Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> and look me in the eye. Yeah. Well, you're, you're looking at something else. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. Wow. I chewed those seeds. How's that That's taste? good. Isn't that good? Yes, it is. The sweetness from the pomegranate at the end? Oh, I like this. So, um, so what we're going to do is you're going to go to our kitchen, and you're going to prepare this pasta dish. It's what, what exactly are you preparing for us? So today I'm preparing my pappardelle pasta with bacon and peas. Okay. It's got a tomato cream-based sauce. Um, it's... Uh, like I said, super easy. So you guys are going to come over and check out. I'm going to ask you thing. questions about the sauce when we're in the kitchen. Because usually it's cream-based. But th that doesn't necessarily mean that it's lots of cream, right? No. It no. can be a very small amount. Just a tiny bit to sort of, like, make the sauce pink and sort of give it a velvet, velvety texture. That's all. Brilliant. All right. I saw these in the store when I went before we go to break. These are salted nuts. Or salted nut roll. Those are good. They were, aren't they good? Yeah. Happy Valentine's Day, John. Oh, thank you so much. Or Adrian and these. John. Salt, sweet, salty nut roll, John. Nuts. Who, who doesn't like sweet, salty nuts? <laughs> happy Valentine's Day. Anyway, happy Valentine's Day. We're going to take it. We're going <laughs> to. The boys in the booth laugh. They understand. They're laughing. John and, and, and Garrett and they're and laughing Allie. because you did what you love doing. You love tongue tying me. To tie doing John that. up. <laughs> but uh, so we're going to send uh, Adrian De Bernardini's. Off to our kitchen to make our pasta dish, and then John and I are going to come back, and uh, we're going to do caught my eye business birthday, and uh, then you, John and I are going to join in kitchen. Adrian in the kitchen, which I'm sure is going to be a, a mess. So um, <laughs> stay with us; we'll be right back. Brought to you by Volkswagen. Visit vw.com to learn more. Focus on the savvy side of 9 to 5 with the Focus Group. Try, really try. Listen, laugh, and learn with Tim and John. I never try anything. I just do it. There. <laughs> Welcome back to Focus Group. John Nash here with Tim Bennett. Hello. Focusgroupradio.com is the site for all the information on our show. Platforms are on, all our audio, including a new addition we have if you're an audio feed if you're the podcast feed uh, listener, we now do a new show on Tuesdays called Focus Group Unbuttoned. Max 20 minutes. Tim and I get a little more political, a little more casual in some of our, <laughs> sort of topics. Would you say that's about right? Yeah, I would say it's probably, um, yeah, a little more leeway. A little more leeway, Perhaps, yeah. Or a little, little bit out of the box. In studio, in our studio kitchen, and you'll be seeing him a little bit later, is the bare naked chef, Adrian D. Berardinis. And he Oof. is going to be showing us how he cooks bare naked. I just caught a glimpse. I was taken off the yeah, rails. I'm back. John, John, yeah. I'm back. I have to edit that out. So, Mr. Bennett, before we begin, I want to tell you about a funny little thing that happened on the subway the other day. I was riding, and I think it's a sign of the times. I was riding uptown, and these two guys, Con Ed workers, they were off shift for the day. They were just talking about going upstate to a cabin with their families. And they were going to try to enjoy the snow. And one guy said... I hope my sister doesn't bake that pound cake again. And so I thought, oh, I love pound cake. <laughs> I didn't say anything. I'm just holding a rail. I'm, they're, they're sitting in the chair. 
And the other one goes, whoa, that pound cake last year, man, I was sweating and I was hallucinating. It turns out the pound cake was an edible. And the sister had, so I hear this whole story going up from like 34th Street to uh, 80 something. She and put pot in the, in the She pound made cake. a pound cake laced with marijuana and she told everybody in the family, eat a very small amount. And the, the brother who had the cake said, I love pound cake, I'm going to have my slice. <laughs> and he had a slice of the cake and he said the entire weekend, or the entire first day, he was sweating, hallucinating. He said, it was a crazy day. I thought, when's this going to end? When's this going to end? I interject. And I said, I had a friend who ate a Tootsie Roll that was homemade, and the hands on the clock were going backwards. <laughs> yeah. So I just thought you might appreciate that. Oh, thank you for that. I mean, that was, uh, I don't know, some of that, well, you know, it's become more, they just started selling medical marijuana in Pennsylvania today, actually, is the first day on uh, Valentine's Day, which is kind of odd. It's a lot, lots of things going on today. It's Valentine's Day. It's Ash Wednesday. Ash Wednesday. Yeah. Celebrate that. It's and my college's birthday today. Marietta Marietta's College. Birthday? That's why I've got my little Marietta oh, hey, congrats. sweatshirt on. By the way, Tim went to an amazing college. I've gotten to visit it, the campus, and I can see why you love it. So they want us to do a show there in October. I would love to do out. a show. I would it, For homecoming? Funny, yeah. I would happily do a show out there. She'd probably end up getting an honorary degree and didn't have to pay for it. Because <laughs> <laughs> you'd be such a star. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. All right, so on this uh, Valentine's Day, what caught your eye, Mr. Bennett? What caught your eye? Here's what Tim and John found. Well, speaking of um, clothing or no clothing, I guess, and, I, you know, these things just happen when I see what caught my eye. The headline of this was, one in five of you is filthy, a filthy lot you are, wearing your pants more than once without washing them. So what, the finger went up, what? Pant, are they defining pant like jeans? So they, so there's a study in England that they did, but then they also brought it to the U.S. and they decided they were going to ask people how often they wash their clothing. Okay. And so they found out that most people say they don't, and I, I, I agreed with this. They, they said that the jeans they usually wear three to four times before they wash them. Do you do that? Um, I rarely wash my jeans. I was wondering what that was. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Well, okay, so you must wash them. Here, here, here's a prime example of why oh, this fascinates this me. Gonna, this is going to change the percentage. I, I went to a G Star the other day, uh, about a year ago, and I bought a pair of jeans, and it had this kind of waxy finish. And the guy said to me, "You do know you're not supposed to wash these." He said, "And if you do, wash them inside out, and it should only be once every couple of months." And then I, a, a bunch of friends, everybody says, oh, yeah, yeah, don't, you're not supposed to wash your jeans, every, wash them inside out, air dry them the whole the jeans. bit. And what about your underwear? N never more than one wearing. That, that, that's, that's what you have laundry for. Well, that's know. what they said. They said a third of the men, and they said maybe men are just more willing to admit it than the women. Only 10% of the women said they'll wear their underwear twice. Men said that they, 31% of the men confessed to wearing underwear twice, and 6% of them said they'll turn it inside out. <laughs> that's vile. I think so, too. Yeah, that's pretty vile. Now, the girls, I was going to ask Allie, apparently the ladies with the bras, I didn't even think about this, 26% say that they wear their bra five times or more, and a lot of them say they wear them 10 times or more, the bra. I don't know, Allie. We, we've got Allie here. We can't see her, though, but I don't know about the ladies. Did, did she wash her bra often, hands I up? Mean, <laughs> I have a lot of bras, but I, I mean, I wore this bra, same one yesterday, and I will tell you I didn't do my laundry last night. But also, your breasts um, are clean. Mine well, are it's... clean more so than like you go it's to the bathroom. I'm not going to disagree with that. Okay. I, I would. I your would girlfriends that. wash their bras, boys? No. Uh, every once in a while, she hand wash them. Yeah, See, I didn't yeah. think about the bra. Did you? That's the, the that's the for the finer so line. I was fascinated yeah. with these. So I was looking for pictures. I don't know if the pictures came up, but I, so there, there we go. There were some men, and they, they were well, talking about if you sweat, you obviously need Andrew to Christian model. That you obviously be, need to change. But the next I'll one, buy I was, the underwear he's wearing and not wash it. Yeah, I was that? fascinated by the bullet bra. Look at the whip. Look at the boobs on these women. I couldn't. I, if you're watching on the on Facebook or YouTube. These bras from the 50s, these bullet bras. Remember Madonna made them famous then yes, in the 80s. Yes, but, but, but you picked up vintage photos. These, yeah, these were actually from the, wow. So they actually then <laughs> went to, and they said, if you do the sniff test, don't pick up your shirt, your T-shirt or whatever and smell it because you're probably just smelling deodorant. They said your underwear and T-shirts, anything that touches the body should be washed yep. all the time mm -hmm. because of bacteria. So then they went through and they talked about pajamas three or four times it should be washed. Bed sheets. How often should you wash your bed sheets? I'd say once a week. They say once every two weeks is okay. Bath towels need to dry. You could use them three to five times. Underwear after each wearing. Bras, they recommend two or three times, Allie. 
Um, <laughs> suits, they suits is the odd one, and also jackets. I wouldn't. I would. I don't want to clean a jacket all the time. Suit coats, and uh, in fact, you ruin them. Yeah, and and too them. much dry cleaning is bad for them. Yeah, that's yeah. So they said that. Uh, so that can, if you can imagine, this was a study from the American Cleaning Institute of uh, trying to figure out how often um, people should wash things, and they they did a whole list of all the items and how often they should be done. T-shirts and tank tops, John, after each wearing. I it, well, yeah. Anybody who goes to the gym knows that. I mean, even the gym clothing gets you know dumped in the laundry basket. The underwear one though, I re, I've seen. I remember guys in college like that's that. a college Pick, thing. Them, yeah. I, I, yeah, that's college. No one wanted to do laundry in college. It was a bore. Turn it inside out. <laughs> Adrian, do you clean your underwear all the time? It's our chef. I wear my underwear once, once okay. <laughs> once at a time. Yeah, one wearing at a time. Right. What caught your eye, Mr. Nash? Mine was a little different. Um, always is. It always is. That's what the beauty of a caught our eye segment is. So there's an Instagram profile by an 11 year old boy who's catching a lot of attention because he draws little cartoons um, about the president and about other political figures that you may know and like or not like. And his Twitter or his uh, Instagram handle is at ant ant dot trump dot cartoons. So he's anti trump dot cartoons. How old is he? He's 11. A lot of people don't believe he is, but he's 11. And you think so, his parents set him up for this? No, no. The parents, the parents said he's a very smart kid. He watches TV. He's aware of the news, and he does this. <laughs> so this first cartoon has a picture of Trump in a diaper saying, I want to go to Mar-a-Lago. I don't care that the government shut down <laughs> with, the, with the golf club, the golf bag next to him. I love the him, golf right? bag and the red face. And, and then the, the little marks around him. All right, what's the next one, John? Oh, the map of the world. This is one of my favorite ones. An 11 year old did this. So the United States says me, and there's a picture of Trump in there. South of the border is tra uh, drug trafficking and, um, rapists. and rapists. And then below that, it says don't care. Yeah. South America, don't care. Um, Africa has shithole on it. And Russia has the best land in the world. <laughs> I think <laughs> mom and dad did something to do there's, don't you think? And there's hearts around Vladimir Putin's face. <laughs> And I think it's, and then this is one of my favorites, when Trump revealed his weight after his physical, <laughs> so the little boy lines up three famous athletes, and they're all 6'3", 240 pounds. One's a football player, basketball, or baseball player, or weightlifter, no, it's baseball player, and then a football player. And at the very end is Trump holding up his hands in the air, and what's falling out of his hands on the far right? McDonald's. A box of extra large fries. Yeah. <laughs> and he's 240 pounds. So the, even if a child could figure out how cynical and hypoc hypocritical that is to say, oh, this is what I weigh. I think, oh, here's uh, my, no, Kim, my button is bigger. This next drawing shows Trump at his desk throwing a tantrum. He's crying and screaming that his button is bigger than Kim Jong-un's. That is, you know, it, it, I, I'm wondering whether this is a... Uh... Oh, yeah, trust me. Um... Because it is a little bit, it, it's funny. So it's it, aside from the hilarity of the drawings, the kid is clearly quite talented as an artist who pays attention to detail. <laughs> Note Trump's always has little hands, by the way, little hands. But some of the pushback was some of the on the right were like, no way is this a little child. This is all contrived. This is all being done. But the parents say, no, this is really him. He, he's doing stuff. Though it does remind me of the, you know, Tim Mahoney, our friend, his little son, Sam. During the whole Mono, Monica Lewinsky problem with Bill Did Clinton. Did Sam draw pictures? No, so they were watching TV, and I remember Chris saying this. He was six years old, and they said he's listening to the, about the stain on the blue dress. And they were talking about the <laughs> semen stain and everything on the blue dress. And it said Monica Lewinsky's attorney, Linda Trapp's attorney, Bill Clinton's attorney, Hillary, and they're going on and on and on. And Chris is in the kitchen cooking, and then she hears, Mom? And she's like, oh, no, here it comes. He wants to know about what happened to the dress. And she goes, yes, Sam. And he goes, do we have an attorney? <laughs> That's all he and she goes, yes, we do. It's our Uncle Greg. And Does she, Uncle Greg wear a blue dress? But that's all, because she thought, oh, my God, he's going to ask about this stain on the dress and what it was. And he, he, all he kept hearing was attorney, attorney, attorney. So you could see where the little kids would, you know, either I pick up uh, on it. Or... I don't doubt it. I don't doubt it. That's funny. So, yeah, I thought you'd enjoy that. And, the little, and, the, and he draws. It's, I could see an adult cartoonist imitating a child's style. That's how, That's where you went, maybe. Well, with... Wasn't that cartoon Little Bush or something? Wasn't there a cartoon? Yes, there was. And uh, I forget. Was it Comedy Central? I had the network. Yeah. And it was. Yeah. they were all baby. I think Garrett, yeah. And, uh, but this is decidedly different. And it does look like there's a couple of cartoons he did on Instagram about Michael Wolf when his book came out. And they're yeah. hilarious. It's all... It, it's, it's, so it's it, it's probably an 11. I'll, I'll take Occam's razor. The simplest explanation must be the truth. Be the it's truth. 11 year old right. kid. 
All right. Hey, it, 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 uh, it's smelling good in here if you just joined oh my us. God. We've, uh, we've you should have sent bear, cards out to people. <laughs> we've, got, we've got the bare naked chef over in our kitchen, which we'll be joining him after we uh, finish this segment to uh, cook a special Valentine's meal. So uh, be sure to stay with us. So the business birthday today. Everyone does celebrity birthday greetings, but the Focus Group is the only show in the universe that celebrates business birthdays. I was surprised. So this is February 14th, 1859. I'm surprised we've not, never done this birthday in all the eight years. We never hit a Feb I 14. I don't think so. I don't think so, although I could be wrong, but I don't think we've done this birthday. It's okay. George Washington Gale Ferris Jr., as in the Ferris wheel? Born, in eight, oh. born February 14th, 1859. He died at 37 years old in 1896 in November of typhoid fever. He was an American engineer. He was known for creating the Ferris wheel for the 1893 Chicago World's Columbian Exposition. He, uh, he grew up in Illinois. He was born in, in Galesburg, Illinois. And uh, the family moved to Nevada for a while. He ended up going to uh, Rensselaer Polytech, became a civil engineer. And he started working in the railroad industry and ended up founding a company in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where he would inspect metal and railroads for infrastructure. So his house in Pittsburgh, where you, you're from, where you grew That's up. That's where the row house you That's where the, okay. it's now a national okay. landmark. And, uh, they, and Pittsburgh has uh, put it on their designated historic structures. So in, in, uh, in 1891, he was drawn to um, the world's Columbian exposition they were doing in Chicago. And they sent out this challenge to all these American engineers to conceive a monument that would surpass and overshadow the Eiffel Tower in Paris because the Eiffel Tower, when that... That was for an exposi exposition right. as well. So they're like, how are we going to beat the Eiffel Tower? So he proposed this wheel, and he said it was going to be a wheel that went around the structure, and uh, it was going to out Eiffel Eiffel. <laughs> and Wait, it's going to out Eiffel out Eiffel. Eiffel, Eiffel. And I like they, that. Okay. He was young, and they, they thought it wouldn't work. They were convinced it wasn't going to work. That was a huge, there's a, a, a famous book called yeah. uh, and Something in the White City. Yeah. And they talk about how everybody thought that thing was going to collapse, don't get in it. So they said he persisted and they kept saying, no, you can't do this. So he, and then somebody thought, you know what, I wonder if this works, we could get out of debt because the city was in debt from putting on this fair, Chicago. So he persisted. They said he returned in a few weeks with respectable endorsements and a group of people who agreed to contribute $400,000 to build it. 400000 back So they the built day, it. Right. It, uh, it ended up um, being a success. It was 36 cars. It reminds me of the London Eye, if you remember there what that is. a number like, of people. like rail cars. You fit you 60 like, in a car. Everybody goes in one car, right? Right. So the total capacity of 2,160 people. They said when the fair opened, it was taking 38,000 passengers a day for the 20-minute ride. It cost 50 cents then, which was a lot of money. Um, at the end of the fair, though, he was supposed to share in the profits. It, it made $750,000, and nobody gave him any money. They wouldn't give him any money. And so he got involved in litigation and a lawsuit and unfortunately got typhoid fever at the age of 37 and died. So he, was, he died in Pittsburgh in the hospital. And the sad thing is, it said his ashes remained in Pittsburgh for over a year waiting for somebody to come possess them. No family for a year? Anything. Yeah. They said Google honored him in February of 2013 on his birthday with an interactive doodle of the Ferris wheel on the front page. Wow, wow. I, uh, look, that's one of my... I, you are correct. We have never done... You have never profiled him before. No, I was surprised by it. And him. it's not like... I'm sure we've at some point in the... We're almost on air. In March, it's a decade. Well, like John Deere last week. Yeah, but we had we've not done John before. Deere before. Yeah. So it's been good that we've been finding some of these new new birthdays. Excellent. All right. Hey, friends, as you know, Deep Discount is a partner of ours here on the Focus Group. Happy Valentine's Day to you from Deep Discount. Uh, for the month of February, they are giving our listeners a 15% off your entire order, one-time use coupon. The, the code is FG15. So if you're going to put a Focus Group order together of discs and movies, by all means, use FG15 to get 15% off, one-time use only. It's, all, it's not good for games, and, and this doesn't bother Tim at all. It's not good for games or game consoles and accessories, right? None of that bothers not worried about it. No. So uh, this month, the, uh, the sale, I, one of my favorite sales of the year is Mystery, Suspense, and Film Noir. And I love, I'm a big, big, big fan of Film Noir for a whole host of reasons, namely because of the cinematography and some of the directors who created some of these amazing films back in the 40s and 50s. And we're going to kick it off with a movie that you picked that I, would you put this in Suspense or Mystery? I would put it in fact. I love to deal in fact as you love to deal in fiction, or you love to deal in fantasy with science fiction, with yeah. animals riding radiators on the moon and whatever. 
But this this one here, Mr. The... James describing Star Wars, in case you didn't know. <laughs> Wookiee on a radiator flying through the woods. I like I like things based on facts. So the two Mrs. Grenvilles, which um, mm. Dominic Dunn is Dominic Dunn wrote um, wrote the, wrote a novel, and he it was also based on Truman Capote's uh, novel, which was Answered Prayers. Ah. It was about the Woodward murders in 1955. He was a famous banker. Um, society elite in Long Island. The wife supposedly hears a prowler. They thought she was a gold digger. He ends up killing her, or she ends up killing him. And they, they get ostracized from society. And so this goes through the whole um, series of what happened. And actually, when Capote was putting the book out that was loosely based on the murders, Anne uh, Woodward took a cyanide pill and then um, Oof. The, the, the husband just said, or the husband's wife just said, well, that's it then. He killed her. Or she killed him, the the mother. So, anyway, I love the whole and you picked intrigue of that. You picked uh, the two Mrs. Granville's on DVD, right? Yes, it's on DVD. It's um, I believe it's a great price, twelve fifty one. I always love how they pick the numbers there. <laughs> so it's twelve dollars fifty one cents for DVD. Which one did you pick? I picked a uh, Orson Welles movie, one of my favorites growing up. It's called Touch of Evil, and. Uh, it is a black and white film noir. It takes place down in Mexico. Charlton Heston, Janet Leigh, Marlena Dietrich, Zsa Zsa Gabor. Now, with a cast like that, this is a great movie. This is a movie you would, it might not be a Valentine's Day movie unless you're a big film noir um, fan, but you could possibly have the Bare Naked Chef dinner along with one of these movies. By right? the way, as a sidebar, sidebar Zsa Zsa Gabor's estate's going up for sale in April if you want to buy anything. Stuff starts at a dollar. <laughs> <laughs> Stuff starts at a dollar. I highly recommend. And by the way, the Blu-ray of Touch of Evil has not one but three copies of the movie. And one of them is Orson Welles' original working print of the edit before the studio had to make some changes or insisted he make some changes. Now, we have some new releases to go through pretty quick. The first is The Deuce, season one. I'm definitely picking this up. James Franco, Maggie Gyllenhaal, a great cast. And this is all about, and I love the way they wrote this, the sleazy, neon-drenched streets of early 70s New York. I'll take the sleazy, neon-drenched streets again. Times Square looks like a Walt Disney World lately. That's not what I picked up on. I picked on uh, how their lives were impacted by the burgeoning business of legalized pornography. Legalized pornography. Well, that's what it's about. And, uh, and yeah. the, the deuce, I think that was an HBO show, right? I'm pretty I'm not, sure it was HBO, yeah, but I'm, season one is. Uh, yeah, yep, Garrett's HBO. gave me a thumbs up in the booth. It's uh, Season one's available on Blu-ray. And the other one is Roman J. S. Uh, Roman J. Israel Esquire, which is also on Blu-ray for twenty-three and change. It's about uh, a gifted but socially awkward attorney. Roman J. Israel is played by Denzel Washington. He seems to like to play attorneys, and uh, it's kind of about his disenfranchised and offbeat uh, life. And uh, also stars Colin, Colin Farrell. So that's uh, that's also out at deep discount. So what is our, if we review them again, John, we picked... Uh, you picked The Two Mrs. Grenvilles, which is right. a wonderful uh, adaptation of the book starring Anne-Margaret and Claudette Colbert, who I met one year and compared her voice to another try. actress. I got in real trouble for that. Then Touch of Evil on Blu-ray, John picked... Uh, the Deuce, season one, with uh, James Franco. is a new release, and also Roman J. Israel is a new release. Be sure to head over to focusgroupradio.com and click on the Deep Discount logo. As John says, if you type in the words uh, FG15. On your order. On your order, you get 15% off the entire order, one time for Focus Group listeners. And uh, what do we like to say, Garrett? Thanks, Deep Discount. There we go. If uh, We're going to take a quick break, and then John and I are going to join Adrian, the Bare Naked Chef, in the kitchen to uh, have him prepare a pasta deal for us. So stay with us. Brought to you by Volkswagen. Visit VW.com to learn more. Introducing the Volkswagen Atlas, large enough to handle everything from the daily carpool to a weekend adventure. It comes standard with seven seats and an easy access third row that features class leading legroom. The Atlas is filled with features and technology designed to help its occupants connect. From Volkswagen CarNet App Connect to available features like an eight inch glass touchscreen display and the VW digital cockpit. With available 4Motion all-wheel drive, you can switch between four different all-wheel drive modes to the one that fits your current driving situation. Also, the Atlas is backed with America's best bumper-to-bumper -bumper limited warranty. The all-new Volkswagen Atlas. 
Life's as big as you make it. Focus on the savvy side of 9 to 5 with the Focus Group. And in business a week, I got more money and I know what to do with. Listen, laugh, and learn with Tim and John. Herrera Rocher. Hey, he is doing well. Hey, welcome back to the Focus Group. John Nash with Tim Bennett, and in between us is Adrian the Bare Naked. Did you go to the gym? Uh, a little bit. Oh, okay. <laughs> I have to work up all this food. So that we're, I we're in the make believe kitchen, right? I see myself. It's a real kitchen. Here. We're in the it's Rachel Ray kitchen. kitchen. It's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> all Great right. Ceilings. Adrian is making for us. Why don't you print it? It's a. Uh, so I'm making um, one of my favorite pasta dishes called pappardelle with uh, bacon and peas, and it's a tomato and cream based sauce. Um, with a few ingredients, it's super easy to make. I told you guys earlier, it'll take you close to 20 minutes to make it, so you can wow your uh, Valentine. Or it smells your fantastic. In the pan, I'm looking at so, a, a big thing of garlic. Yeah. Actually, you didn't you didn't cut it up, or? no? Because um, we don't want the garlic flavor to be too intense. So if keeping you, it as a keeping it whole, sometimes even in the skin, it gives it a milder, sweeter flavor. I never heard of that. Yeah. So what happens is uh, there's a chemical process that happens when the metal touches the garlic when, when you're cutting it. So it releases um, this sort of bitterness. So if we keep it whole, it's so not going to So literally when bitter. the knife cuts it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So let me... Um, and then Adrian also has chopped up bacon and onion and a little bit of olive oil and this smells fantastic. Yes. So we've rendered some bacon and sweat some onions and I've thrown in the whole garlic clove and so what we're going to do is saute that a little bit um, and uh, that takes only a few minutes. The next step is to add the um, strained tomatoes. You can find this at any grocery store. Strained tomatoes. Strained tomatoes, not tomato puree. Uh, it's unflavored, uh, unseasoned, so it's just pure tomatoes that have been So steamed. what is the difference between um, strained and puree? You're just probably saying it right now. Not processed, right? This is cold pressed, so it's put through a press, and pureed is obviously it's put through like a blending process. So they take all the stuff out. <laughs> exactly. What's, you know what, I have a question. What's the difference uh -huh. between a stock and a broth? Um, well, a stock is uh, something that you use for cooking, and broth is something that you use to eat. So it's very similar. It's okay. just the flavor intensity of the broth is a little more intense. Okay, I didn't realize that. So what you have out here is that. So is, these are, are the those ingredients. Our ingredients. Yes. Okay. So we use about a quarter cup of uh, chopped sweet onion. Okay. Um, one clove of garlic that I've uh, put in there. Um, We've got some English peas, some well, let's sweet talk about peas. About a half cup, maybe. About a half cup. Okay. Yep. Some uh, thick cup bacon, smoked. Um, you can use pancetta. I prefer smoked bacon just because you really get that smoky flavor. Um, and it, I use used about three strips of that, cut up into small pieces. Some fresh Parmigiano Reggiano that's been grated. Olive oil, salt, and pepper. Some uh, whipping cream that we're going to add a Wait, little dash of later. Not heavy cream, but whipping cream. Whipping okay. cream. You can use heavy cream, or you can even use half and half. Um, having half is a little bit sweeter, but uh, we're only using a little bit, so it's not going to sort of change the flavor. What about the, the cheese you see on the shelf at the grocery store, and the and the, and the, and the, the shake cheese? It's is that? It's uh, probably as uh, good for you as like American cheese. I would stay away from that stuff. Okay. The uh, the real uh, authentic Italian Parmesan cheese is called Parmigiano Reggiano, or um, you know, there's a couple of different varieties, but you want to generally buy it fresh. It can okay. come grated for you in the grocery store these days. But I the shake fresh. stuff, what, there was this whole thing oh, where like, somebody once said there was sawdust in there. I think that's what it is. It's, a, it's not <laughs> really there. Yeah, yeah wow. it's sawdust. So now that we've um, rendered these, we're going to add our tomato, uh, about, about a cup of that. So when you're doing this at your house and you're trying to, uh, trying to uh, impress your visitor, are, are, you, are they sitting having one of the cocktails while you're doing this, or do you like them in the kitchen with you? I like them in the kitchen, so we can talk. Um, okay. Some people can help chop, you know. But, uh, you know, You course. don't appear to be somebody who likes help in the kitchen. Well, <laughs> well help could be just talking to the chef. Yeah, I know, but you know what I mean? I put you to you work know what in you're, a minute, You know what so. you're doing, right? Yeah, yeah so I, I boiled, got water to a boil. Right when you start doing this process, you can um, actually add some salt to the water. And what now you're adding sea salt. I'm adding sea salt. And you're adding quite a bit. Yeah, I'm using about that's uh, like a, a port, like teaspoon. a port, uh, okay. Yeah, that's a teaspoon. Te te about a teaspoon. Yeah, yeah. I'd say it's a tablespoon. But <laughs> I'm sorry, a tablespoon. Yes, you're absolutely right. Uh, and so what that does is that flavors the water and the pasta, so you're not having to add more salt to the sauce. 
So you're not tasting a sort of bland pasta. Water picks it up. Yeah. The pasta gets a little hint of it. Exactly. Is that regular pasta? This is Pappardelle pasta. So it's a semolina, semolina flour pasta. Uh, Pappardelle. I love is, it comes in these little bundles. Yeah, they're kind of little nests, and they when they obviously cook, they turn into ribbons. So what do you think about the rice pastas or the wheat pastas or any of that stuff? I mean, I think, you know, for people that have dietary restrictions, it's absolutely fine. It does have a different taste to me, but, you know, I mean, it's in a healthier option, so... Or There's people using cauliflower or vegetables, or you, you believe in the purity of the pasta? Absolutely. I mean, there's nothing like the original, um, but again, some people can't uh, actually, you know, for health reasons, right. take flour. Would you eat that? So no, we're going to toss this um, garlic clove and put it, well, let's toss it right in there, okay. because we really just want to only got it. You only got Now, while we're cooking, um, you're leaving for South Africa soon. I am. Next month, I'm going on a... Uh, expedition trip. I'm cooking for the guests. There's about 20 guys that are going. It's a LGTB uh, run and owned company that does these amazing adventure tours and this one happens to be in Cape Town, South Africa. And um, so I'll be cooking breakfast. Have you been there before? Never been. There's no, no so water. Today. We were yeah, just no, in a drought. I, I said to Adrian, I said they pushed the, the end of the water they, gate. Well, they, they knew he was coming. So, so apparently the population is doing a little more um, conservation. I'm going to add those peas now, okay? And the, you called, these were... Uh, English. Why don't you put English them all in there? Sweet pea. Yeah. Is there is there, an, is there something about like an English pea that's different from a normal like bird's eye frozen Yeah, they're born pea. in the UK. Um, <laughs> we like that. We do like that. Well, no, I was wondering, just, fresh versus frozen. Sweet. Um, you know, fresh peas are hard to find. Yeah. And honestly, frozen peas are just as good. They're okay. just as sweet. Yeah, someone once told me that frozen vegetables are a great substitute because they're frozen yes. at the flash time of picking. Frozen. Flash frozen, exactly. right, at the time of picking. Hmm. So as we put in that pasta, it's going to take about five about to six minutes. During, you just let nope, it sit and do its thing? thing? I mean, you can give it a little, do you want to give it a little toss? I'll let you I'll just I'll stir it, John. Like stir stir the nest yeah. up. So I always like to taste things as I go. You need this for? I do. I'm going to use this for. Do you need me to do anything here? I'm going to have you chop some of this basil up. Just a little right chiffonade. Now? Yeah, a little rough chop. <laughs> a little what? Right chiffonade. now. No, later. Do you know what that is? <laughs> yeah. Little ribbons. <laughs> later. Oh, it smells good. I can never find fresh basil this time of year. You should are the stems okay? Some. Are the stems okay? It's available all year round um, at any grocer. Yeah. There you Am go. I doing you all right? Cut yourself. Yeah, you're doing great. Smells good. I love basil. So this, this part of the sauce is almost done. Now we're going to add the cream to it. Sorry, please. And we talked about this before where you were not, that's, that's hardly any. It's just a little bit to make it a little creamy, a little pink. And we're also gonna add a little pad of butter at the end. So that's gonna give us a nice velvety richness. And you did that to make it this nice pink. Yeah, it, it sort of cuts the acidity of the tomato. Okay. It gives it that creaminess, which is, uh, makes I'm it a little I'm amazed how little you use though. Probably and I say this because my mom is lactose intolerant. And if the chef says I use a little bit of cream, I'm I'm betting it's that small amount. That amount, yeah. And I don't know that that would actually bother somebody. No. Well, you never know. You never know. It's like being yeah, allergic. That, well, that was a tablespoon of, of butter. Put a tablespoon of butter, a little pat of butter, yeah, and that's just going to... What was it that you... Do you have you a... the butter now, though. Mm -hmm. It's going to melt into the sauce, and then we, right before we put But had you added that before you added everything, it would have been part of the onion and the garlic flavor? Yeah, it sort of would change the flavor. We just want to sort of add it at the end. We just want to add cheese and butter at the end when we're cooking pasta dishes or Italian cooking. You um, a fan of, you're a fan of Julia Child? I am a huge fan, yes. She, she, she was all about the butter and the cream, right? Yeah. I mean, oh, that, yeah. was, that was her thing. Don't use margarine, don't use no. substitute. No, you know, the cooking world went into a whole frenzy, um, you know, in the 80s with all this sort of like fat-free, cholesterol-free, all this stuff. Oh my now God. I remember when of... eggs were bad for right. you and eggs like the perfect food. Now you had a little vodka for our drink before. Would you, would you throw, could you throw a little vodka in there? You could. Yes, absolutely. Um, what would that do to it? It's just going to, you know, the alcohol burns off when you cook right. it, so you're not really getting a buzz from it or anything. But you do get a little bit of that vodka sharpness in there if you're not, it's not cooked too, too long. Now, how do you know when your pasta is done? Do you do it by feel? I do it by feel or taste. I usually will take a piece out. But, you know, generally, most pastas, you read the instructions on the back, and they say six to seven minutes. Uh, seven Add minutes. a certain kind of a boil. Right. <clears throat> did I chiffonade okay? What was my word I was looking for? Chiffonade. Chiffonade. You did a great job. 
<laughs> so this is on. on. Chiffon on, chiffon on. What are you guys cooking for Valentine's Day? Are you going out to dinner tonight? Are you taking your... I, well, I don't know what's Valentine's... for dinner tonight. Is Bob cooking tonight? Well, we may we may have something we cooked the other night that we're reheating because it was delicious. It was like this really good meatloaf. Um, I don't know. I have to figure I out. I don't have any plans either. I would usually plans. go over Brian, Brian and Rich's house probably. Or maybe Richard will come over. I don't know. I don't have any plans. Hmm, that's a good thing. Maybe I'll have this. Did you did did, did we bring a Tupperware? I'm, I'm I'm okay. What so. are you doing tonight for Valentine's Day? Um, you know, I don't really have a Valentine at the moment, so I'm just gonna go over to a friend's and uh, cook dinner and did watch a movie. I'm just gonna give this a little taste. Make sure that it's al dente. And al dente, you know what that means? Yeah. To the tooth, right? No, 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 no. Explain that again. Mm. You actually use the right language. I've never. I always just thought it meant not too soft. Al dente teeth. Al dente in Italian means to the tooth. So we want to, it to be tender on the outside, but a little bit of bite on the inside. Got it. Okay. So in a kitchen, <laughs> aside from obviously the stove and refrigerator, are there five things you think you, every kitchen should have? Absolutely. What do? You, what, what kind of things? Really good olive oil. Yeah. Good olive oil. Totally. Mm -hmm. Parmesan cheese. Okay. Okay. Um, but bake. what you said, Parmesan uh, Reggiano. Good Parmesan cheese, yeah. yes. Parmesan Reggiano. Olive oil, Parmesan bacon. cheese. <clears throat> bacon? Mm hmm. Eggs. I got eggs. Eggs, you can do so many different things with eggs. And uh, I guess the fifth thing would be um, just a good on hand bottle of wine. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and a good set of knives. <laughs> Probably. Oh, are you talking six, utensils? Seven, Absolutely. Yeah. So this pasta is, is ready. I'm just going to tong this out, put it directly into the sauce. And you would normally do that too, right? Uh, I would use a strainer sometimes, but this works just as well. I mean, it's okay if a but little bit of... But you plate having pre-mixed the, uh, the pasta with your, with your sauce, right? You don't, you don't like put the pasta down and No, then... no. Italians never serve pasta like that. Um, it's always mixed, the pasta. Because th what happens is the pasta needs to absorb the sauce. It needs to absorb the flavor. So if so you, you don't just put it on the plate and dump the sauce on it. Which is very American. Very American. Totally American, yeah. Well, I have Tim, to tell remember, Brian and remember, Rich. Do you remember when we had the best um, <laughs> tiramisu ever? Mm, I made tiramisu for a dinner party. I don't know where that was. We were on an island off the coast of Italy. We were on oh, well, yeah, and, they brought, and I had never, ever had tiramisu that tasted quite like that before. And it was like, and they're like, no, this is the way the Italians do it. It's yeah. fresh. And when they, when they tell you to save a, do you ever save the water, the pasta water for anything? I do, yeah. Um, you mean not for like days, but no, just, yeah. <laughs> like you would throw it in the sauce here. Yeah. So what it, what the starched water does is what sometimes uh, it can bind uh, sauce to the pasta. So if it's maybe, and also it can thin it out. So if you know you need more liquid, you can add some of the pasta water into the pasta. Or if you're making a sauce that's not uh, sort of very um, creamy or very saucy, but it's more of like vegetables, the salted water actually kind of breaks down the vegetables to make more flavorful kind of sauce. So when sense. you, uh, normally, as you said, when you're in your kitchen, you would um, not, you'd move, the, you'd move the pasta into a strainer first and then into the dish, and but you would never rinse the pasta. Never, no. Okay. No, because, um, you know, you want it to continue to cook again. You don't want to shock the pasta. And rinsing it would stop it from cooking. It would stop it from cooking, and then it would also, what it does is it blocks the pasta from absorbing any sauce. I didn't know that, yeah. okay. Hmm. So I've just added some Parmesan cheese, about a quarter cup, and the heat is now off, so I'm just giving it a toss, and that's gonna sort of give another layer of flavor. And then we're also gonna cheese when we plate. So you wanna pass me one of those bowls? I will give us. So you already added some cheese. So mm -hmm. this recipe that you did was for four to six people. Yes. So if you, my friends and I, that'd be about three. Yeah. <laughs> Little people. That's about two people, right? <laughs> no, but you know, that was the thing when we were in Italy. I was amazed that when Italians serve pasta, I'm gonna finish it is that. not right. served as a heaping. No. It is part of a, maybe you're having bass or a fish dish or something, so this, and the pasta is like a side thing. Usually. This can be served as like an appetizer, so you would you. serve a portion maybe like that. You just want to taste. Yeah. That's perfect. Exactly. Um, or as a main, and you'd give a little bit more than that, but I mean, you know, pasta doesn't have to be a big heaping mound on your plate. I think it's sometimes a l very unappetizing when you see that because you're just like, oh, I can't eat all of that. This is how Italians eat. They, that's why they're not overweight. Yeah, exactly. That is exactly right. So a little more cheese. And then we're going to garnish with a little bit of your basil that you chopped. 
What did you call that, my chiffonade? Chiffonade. Chiffonade. I just like the way you say it. Thank you. Do you have a fork? Everybody's got forks. Bon appétit. Bon appétit. Happy Valentine's Day. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks for coming and joining us. Anytime. I will see how this goes. Folks, this was not one of those deals where they throw something in the oven and then they come back and they pull it out of the oven and it was only two seconds later. You know everybody they, knows me on this show how much I like to BS sometimes, but this is really good. It's delicious. And I would tell you if it wasn't. Well, I challenge you to try this at home, so. This is really good. I want a full report. I was actually paying a lot of attention to your prep and the sequencing because I think that's probably how you lock in some of the flavor, right? So, definitely, it's layering, laying the, layering the flavor. This is delicious. delicious. So we had two questions come in from Facebook. Quick, quick, quick questions. One of them is, do you, so could, if somebody wanted to hire you to come and do cooking, do you do that? I do, of course. Sort of thing. So do you go around the country or is it just I do, I get local? hired for jobs, um, events all over the country. I was, I did a bachelorette party in Los Angeles um, last fall. Mm -hmm. I got hired to do a birthday party in Palm Springs recently. Um, so yeah, I get invitations and offers, job offers to come to come and cook, and it's not always naked. It's you know I do. Clothes. Well, and that was the other question. So somebody said, you know, what <laughs> it, what do they feel about all the hair? Well, you know, it depends it's on the crowd. Some yeah. people pay extra for that. <laughs> by, by the way, were you surprised um, in your? I, I watched your videos on YouTube, and I, I always scroll down on the, the comment thing, and I I never even thought about it, and then, uh, mostly positive. Mm -hmm. But then you get these weird, like, I would, ooh, like, da -da -da -da. Yeah. and I'm thinking to myself, most people don't know a kitchen in a restaurant. <laughs> right. <laughs> what is, what, who's touching their food or what's touching And their you're food. worried about this, yeah. this yeah. hot guy cooking your meal mm -hmm. and, you know, I, I don't know. You know, I, I, the, the cooking naked thing, and for those of you out there that do it, I support you and I, I love <laughs> you and I, I just say be careful. Um, obviously, splatter, the grease splatter. And oil. Yeah. But, you know, it, it, from, it's not something sort of to be taken so literally all the time either. It's more of an expression yeah. about, you know, uh, my experience and sort of who I am and I'm sort of taking... You're about good food. I'm about good food. about the, before we... Naked food. The, uh, the al dente. Mm -hmm. The pasta tastes perfect to me. I don't know that I would have cooked it quite like this. I might have actually gone longer. Some people uh, and is that like a knee-jerk reaction people have? Like, oh my God, it's you know. Well, it's it's more about your what you're accustomed to, and you know, as Americans, we're accustomed to eating pasta that's maybe a little bit less firm. <laughs> but you're so, being generous, you're like a wet noodle, you know. Wet noodle, yes. I, I don't like mushy pasta, but you know, it's interesting. Even in Italy. Parts of Italy, they're more accustomed to eating it very al dente, and down south, they're eating it much more, uh, much less cooked. So, you know, it's just more of your, how your palate's been developed and, and your sort of texture. I always like al dente. Mouth. I always prefer it. But you're right, Americans. Well, it's like our vegetables. We overcook them all the time yeah. too. So, hey, we want to thank you for joining us. Thank Tell people how they me. can contact you. Yes. So you can contact me um, well on Facebook. I'm Adrian De the Bare Naked Chef on Facebook, Instagram. Bare Naked Chef, Twitter, Chef Bare Naked, <laughs> and you can go to my website. Chef Bare Naked. Um, Chef Bare Naked. Got to flip it around. Uh, my website, which is uh, the Bare Naked Chef, uh, Bare Naked Chef .com. and uh, you can get all my contact information on there. My email. If you'd like to hire me for events or for appearances. Uh, yeah, contact this me. This recipe's there too, right? And that re this recipe's on there. Right. Yes, my including secret. our cocktail recipe. No, that is not on there. Uh, it's pomegranate that's juice, prosecco, and vodka. That's pretty easy. There, with the, was, with a, the there was a method to that. Oh, I observed that making very carefully. I'll post something on Facebook. <laughs> and uh, if you go to focusgroupradio.com, we'll also have the recipe there as well as all the contact information for Adrian. We want to thank uh, Adrian for joining us here, the Bare Naked Chef. And thank uh, you. Uh, thank you to Brian at Admark360. You're, everyone's familiar with Brian. He was able to, uh, to get Adrian to come see us, so we appreciate that. He twisted behind his the arm. Scenes. There's thank there's you, John, Allie, and Garrett, yeah. and our producer. Producers for bringing us uh, bringing us to you. Thank you, John. Thanks to our friends at Deep Discount for supporting us here in the Focus Group, and of course our friends at Volkswagen. Be sure to go to VW.com and check out all the great cars Volkswagen has to offer. They've got a new car they just launched in Chicago or just showed in Chicago Ardeon? called the Ardeon, which is a replacement for the old CC, if you remember. It's a great car. So everybody remember, don't text and drive. Arrive alive. Happy Valentine's Day. And uh, we're going to finish eating. So take care. Yay. Bye, everybody. <laughs> It's The Focus Group with Tim Bennett and John Nash.
formerly on Sirius XM Satellite Radio and now accessible on all platforms. Subscribe, like, and rate us on your platform of choice. Learn more at focusgroupradio.com. That was a stunning focus group.